Well done, Sally. Thanks, Maylin, again. <laughs> well, then we move from the US to um, Europe. Falk Eman from IMA will give his views on MECDs. Thank, uh, thanks for coming. Thank you very much for the invitation, and um, I try to be brief. I'll skip over some slides rather quickly because either it has been said already, or I understand the slides will be made available for you in a later stage. So there's no need to um, take it from the discussion time because I think it's very important. I have a lot of questions for my colleagues as well, which I am not supposed to ask yet. So I'll rather save some time now and then go ahead later. Okay. Um, first of all. It's very important, especially talking talk internationally, what are nanomedicines? There are different definitions here and there. You see different publications. Some are included, some are non-included. This is a little bit what um, tries to combine um, at least the three major region what we're talking about. So it's uh, purposely designed systems in the nanoscale, more or less between one and um, uh, 1,000 nanometer. However, if they're now a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, what do we do? We wouldn't exclude them. I think the real point is that they are um, resulting in definable specific properties and characteristics. Um, to support this intended use and for clinical advantages. Clinical advantages, and I really want to have an emphasis on this one. And um, actually, having heard the other two talks, um, my major remarks will be um, after the last slide. So what are they supposed to do? Like any other drug, they're supposed to address a medical need in society. And um, how do we do this? Um, trying to maximize, uh, maximize efficacy and reduce dose and toxicity. This is now not a medicine in general, so not specific for generics. What is our experience? Again, the different publications, sometimes, sometimes a bit more, sometimes a bit less, depending on the definition. But um, we saw around um, 20 marketing authorizations, um, mo most of them in cancer, and um, scientific advices, something like IND. So what's in the pipeline? Um, around 50. We saw an orphan drug designation. Innovation task force is something I'm personally doing at the agency, so trying to engage with um, any kind of stakeholder as early as possible. And the small and medium-sized enterprise office. We recently published a paper where it states that 50% of compounds which make it to the market originate from SME, academia, or private public partnerships. Of course, it's a big boy to put it to the market then, the big clinical clinic trial, but it's really the SME and the academia where the idea originates from. And that's why I think um, we are sitting in this forum, because lots of you are involved into this one, and that's what we're trying to promote. I won't go into details now, because I think there are three further talks um, going specific in the case studies. So um, liposomes, um, Kelix, Mepac, and um, Myosat, um, all three of them are cancer drugs, and I think we really We'll hear more about them um, in the next talk, so no need to go into detail here. Nanoparticles, these are all authorized drugs in Europe. Um, Abraxan, um, where the expert is sitting here, and um, Rapamoon and Cinerum, I think it's just worth mentioning that there's something else than cancer and the infective. So diagnostic agents, that we see something in the future coming, hopefully even more, and um, uh, tr um, transplant rejection. Future application, maybe I should put in brackets, hopefully proof of applications, what we see on the market. Um, multifunctional platform, polymeric um, molecules, um, maybe products with integrate some more diagnostics and therapeutics. This is as well maybe to address the pressure on the healthcare systems, which we, um, I think, in every region in the world are feeling at the moment. Um, integrated and applied by sensory um, non-electronic drug systems and remote-controlled nanoprobes. The European regulator created an expert group, and um, this is a little bit the output. I'm not going to detail what these papers say. Um, two were mentioned already here by um, FDA colleague. Just um, that um, they looked at um, novel nanomedicines, so uh, what's coming up, and um, or nanosimilars or um, generics as well. This is all available on our website. Um, there are four different um, reflection paper where we focused on. It was in 2012, so it's not, not the latest stuff, but this is, um, I think, has been the main area of our activity so far. First one um, it was a reflection paper for intravenous liposomal products. Um, I think it's worth mentioning just two po points here. One thing is it's, it's some principles are applicable as well for liposomal-like um, and uh, vesicular products which are under development. And um, we really focus there on the PK parameters. Of course, this was published maybe in 2012, and um, paper was the current thing of 2011, so this is a very 
fluctuant um, um, situation and we see new stuff. But this gives you, I think, an idea about the regulators thinking where it might go or how we try to address novel novelties. The next one is um, on iron-based nanoparticles, non -na iron-based nanocolloidal products. We have another example, I think, later on this one as well. And here, again, um, it explains as well how we look at changes. Because um, one thing, looking at this generic and similarity, I worked for seven years in biosimilarity. And um, a lot of these things apply as well. If an originator drug makes a change in manufacturing, a lot of these kind of thoughts, how we compare certain products, one with these other, this kind of thinking is more or less, well, similar maybe to what is, if you want to put a similar product on the market with same safety and efficacy. Um, so other indications might be applicable as well. It talks mainly um, about uh, um, hemopenia. Then there's a new um, uh, guideline for, for, for innovative um, nanomedicines, and this was drafted mainly on the initiative of um, a Japanese colleague from PMDA on um, block copolymer micelles. And um, there, again, we look rather at early clinical development or even non-clinical development. So there we are waiting for products to come through um, to, to be more precise. Um, the principles are for IV, but other principles might be considered as well. And if there's anything in the product pipeline, we have questions. Um, we always say, please engage with us as soon as possible. We're trying to help you. We're not trying to prevent anything. Another general paper is uh, on the surface coating. We saw questions popping up um, in, in early interactions with stakeholders. And um, therefore, we addressed the paper on nanosurface coating. Again, I won't go into detail right now. but. The main questions we always ask are what is the impact of the coating on safety and efficacy? Because in the end, our main committee is called CHMP, so Committee for Human Medicine and Products. What they need to look at and look at the benefit risk of this product being released for, to the patients. And this is safety and efficacy, which are the two most important things. Which quality, if you wish, is a part of this one. But quality is the first step. You look at products all the time. But at the end, we want to ensure that they are safe. We, um, we gathered this together in, 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 a, in a paper, um, I think it's in 2013, so uh, almost two years ago. But there it summarized a bit these four papers and what the thinking was. We had a workshop, I think, in 2012, 2010, and um, this, this summarized the whole thing a bit. What do we do to support initiatives from you or from any kind of stakeholders? And there we have the SME office. So once you register as a small medium sized enterprise, you are eligible for massive incentives. Really, you pay 90% um, of your fees are waived in terms of scientific advice or in terms of marketing authorizations. So please come and register, and we help you as well with regulatory informal advice, which is for free. Then um, the Innovation Task Force, um, um, Innovation Technology Forum. Um, this is what I'm doing myself at the moment. We are looking um, at innovative products. So if you wish to generics, I'm not necessarily a platform to, to engage with this one there, unless in your approach to do a generic, you have innovative methods. Then, of course, formal scientific advice. This is something you get really formal feedback. And um, you, there are paper, we publish papers which say if you, uh, if you um, adhere to the recommendations as proposed in scientific advice during the drug development, the likelihood, that the, the likelihood is higher that you have a successful marketing authorization at the end. And this was this for, um, <laughs> sorry, being a bit um, quick and brief. Just want to make um, a couple of comments, because we heard a lot about um, characterization, um, quality characterization. It is true that um, the first thing we do is look at quality parameters. And uh, by similar development or generic development or non-complex, uh, non-biological complex drug products, these um, the first thing is we look at quality, and um, we always, um, for this biosimilar approach, which is kind of similar to the nanosimilar or the non-biologic complex drugs approach, we first look at the quality, because quality, sometimes these are the most sensitive methods to detect differences. And if there's a difference, we want to know, does this have an impact on safety and efficacy? But in the end, um, if you look very careful what products made it to the market, maybe there have been some difference in quality, but maybe they never played a role in safety and efficacy. Maybe they are extremely sensitive, and um, you stop a drug development program, 
because you see certain parameters in quality, I'm not a quality expert, I must admit, but if they are slightly different, what kind of impact does it have on safety and efficacy? So don't give up your drug development program because you see certain differences. Try to understand them, try to talk to regulators or to the expert, and then try to justify why they might be there or might not be there. This we see, um, I think, in two issues. One thing is in variations of innovative products. So quite sometimes there are quite significant variations, and they need to explain it, especially in terms of biological drugs. So this is, I think, kind of a take-home message that I would like to um, convey here. And um, the other thing is, um, for example, I was highly involved in the drafting of the um, biosimilar monoclonal antibody guideline, which um, now we see the first products uh, coming through. And there, we, we are highly debated if you see in a, in a, in a cancer um, efficacy trial, phase three trial, if you see a slightly higher sig significant benefit in efficacy um, from the biosimilar to the other one, would you reject this drug, which is even better than the one if you wish to on the market and buy a better? Would it need a different framework? Um, would it be the right message for society to reject this kind of drug? So just want to mention that these things are really complex. And um, if you see some hurdles somewhere here and there, I think the most important thing is talk to the experts, engage with um, the regulators or experts or um, whoever you like to talk to and um, try, to, try to understand why, why this is the case. Um, I'd just like to confirm, I have some more time, no? It's, yeah. One minute, okay, perfect. So absolutely um, agree what has been said before by the FDA, PBPK, this is something um, we really um, draft guidance now and we're looking forward to, um, modeling simulation. Um, extrapolation, um, this for me plays a role as well. How far can you extrapolate from one indication? Can you extrapolate safety? Can you extrapolate efficacy? Um, how similar does it have to be in order to extrapolate? Um, there again, we have a lot of um, lessons learned from biosimilar. So, if we understand a drug like ipoetine, there's one receptor, one mode of action, then the scientist will most likely say, okay, we are very sure there's no or unlikely of target, so we can, we can put the risk threshold a bit higher. If there's something we don't understand at all and um, there are certain differences, then of course the alarm bells go up, okay, might there be a risk we're not aware of? If you wish to admit the unknown, no, the known unknowns, then I think the, the regulator would be, would be rather cautious. Just trying to stimulate a little bit how we try to, as a regulator, how as regulators we try to think, how we try to address um, these, these issues. And I think that's it. Thank you very much. Yes. Thanks, Falk. Um, also helping a little bit with the time issue. Um, question for clarification. Yes, only one question. Let, let's, let's make it a habit to uh, identify ourselves and where we are from, so please. My name is Jose Carballido from Basel. My question is referred to the surface coating. Targeted proteins, antibodies, or other proteins go into the same category as molecules like uh, uh, when you pegylate or you add any sugar, or do you have to treat this separate? I think the surface code, and I, we definitely state that principles applied in this guideline should be um, cross, if you wish, cross, cross jurisdiction. So if there's a scientific rationale, because I don't, I don't know now the, the, the details, so I can only give you a general answer, but if, the, if you have a scientific rationale and you come with a scientific rationale that the same principles apply, then I think um, we should counter-argue these principles unless, unless we agree with them. So I think they could apply. I didn't I get the, the, the direct example now. So you have a monoclonal antibody, in, Okay, well, we can talk this later, but yeah, that's, that's the idea. I think we discussed with here Frank Weichel from the FDA later before how specific can our guidance be, and it's very difficult to put some specific guidance somewhere if we don't know what's coming, what is out there. So um, it's a very good question. Unfortunately, general answer. <laughs> Generic answer.